Thanks. Okay, um, we are short of time now. I think I'm dropping my speech from 20 minutes to 15 minutes. Anyway, I don't know why I've been given 20 minutes because this is still an unfinished project, right? So my my project I presented at last hack where something like three weeks ago uh, was titled the same thing, my NB IoT struggle. Okay, what is IoT? For those who were not here, I will just briefly run through this. If not, I can press this button, skip recap. All right, just like Netflix. It's a collection of devices <laughs> connected by network to collect data and possibly actuate physical actions. Yeah, possible users ranges from consumer to commercial and all the way to infrastructure applications. Yeah, so some of the examples of um, IoT for consumers um, applications, we have wearables, smart um, home, light bulbs, health, etc. Right? Um, for commercial applications, we have medical and healthcare, um, building automation, food chain, supplies, and um, logistics. Then industrial and infrastructure, you can see that the applications get bigger and bigger in terms of scale. Right? Um, okay, so the types of IoT connection types, I've been Caution not to say wired, all right? So anyway, uh, even wired devices are considered IoT devices. Yeah, they're still connected to the internet. And then you want your device to eventually connect to the internet in some manner. So a wired device is still a viable IoT device. The wireless ones, we have Wi-Fi, RFID, NFC, IEEE 802.15.4, which is um, Zigbee is part of it. We have Bluetooth, low energy, which comes only from version 4 onwards. Yeah, we have 6 volts, LoRa, and also finally we have NB-IoT, which is the one I'm experimenting right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm struggling with it. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so the last presentation three weeks ago, I didn't have this slide here. Basically, I just captured a bunch of uh, pictures from Wiki. So NB IoT, or we we start from the top here at the middle here. 4G LTE means long-term evolution, fourth generation, with LTE being a type of 4G, right? It's a high-speed uh, mobile data and voice transmission service. Right? Fast LTE, which is Cat4 or higher, which means it's LTE Cat4, are uh, the fastest ones. You have actually Cat5 and um, 6 in the works. They are uh, ideal for mobile broadband applications and um, therefore it's in use in mobile phones. So lowering down the speeds, right? We have LTE Cat1, which is a medium speed. So this is meant more for data rather than voice and video. Yeah, and finally, at the lowest um, speed range, we have NB IoT. So it uses a subset of the entire LTE standard but it limits the bandwidth of data transferred to only about 200 kilohertz. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that there are actually three types of um, NB IoT uh, implementations. So you have the in-band one. So this trapezoid here represents a band given to, by the country to the service provider. They bid for bands and they get bands of 900 megahertz, 800 megahertz, 1900, whatever the country wants to allow the service provider to get, right? From that band, which is used for normal voice and um, data transmission of your mobile phones and other mobile devices, a narrow portion using modulation techniques, right, is reserved for NB-IoT. So this is the part that is your LTE Cat M1. So there are three implementations. Either you have in-band, which means they reserve just a narrow band for data um, for your NB-IoT, or they can use the guard bands. In the past, I thought the guard bands was reserved for things like SMS, where you have very little data transferred over voice. Yeah? So now they have reused this technique for NB-IoT. Or your standalone band. So some countries may allow their service providers to reserve an entire band of um, the frequency spectrum just for the specific purpose of um, NB-IoT. 
All right, so I don't know what Singapore gives to our two service providers who have implemented MBIOT, they are Singtel and M1. I don't know what technique they use. Yes. Are the guard bands? No. Oh. Full duplex. Oh, full duplex. You can't put the transit frontiers side by side without making very expensive filters. So you put them 100 megahertz apart. Oh. So three filters side by side, it's still a 40 megahertz slice left in between. Five megahertz may be looking back to preserving the guard band, but IMBA is now able to license, and this is next year the year, the big remaining 30 megahertz in between for other applications thereby enriching themselves. <laughs> yeah. This one. The, the All right. Thanks. Okay. So for my case, why I have started experimenting with NBIOT is because a friend of mine who owns a prawn farm in Malaysia wants to test this technique first in Singapore. So he asks me to design some hardware. Right, so what he... That was fast. He wants to do farm monitoring in a remote location where the power and internet is not readily available. He wants to take several readings per day and in many locations. Right, so... He's also given me a suitable, um, suitable enclosure to start working with in terms of form factor, right? So he actually he's given me several. We've decided on a bigger one. This was one of the samples he has given me. So this is IP67. It's waterproof, rainproof, weatherproof. So my customer choices. Of course, he's an experimenter himself, but at modular consumer level. He buys it, things, plugs to get, plugs them together. I don't know whether it has a sample. Oh, yes. So this was his Arduino board. He used an older version of a shield called the SIM 7000C. It's a Chinese-made um, GSM module. And it's also capable of MBIOT. But he never got it working, right? So the next step was that he purchased a slightly more expensive, in fact, a lot more expensive module from... DG. Yeah, so this entire hat here from a Chinese um, supplier cost only $39, whereas this is $103. I know it's expensive. Yeah, but um, he wants it to work quickly. So, and the Arduino, he wants it change from 80 mega to something more powerful and with a bit more versatility. He asked me to use uh, ESP32, right? So we have SIM7000 changing to XB. So the type of interfaces he wanted was all these other things, right? Um, other means of measurement and also interfaces. Then um, pretty unusual also, rechargeable batteries and yet to last three months. And uh, the final addition was a real-time clock so that um, we can make the entire board go to sleep and wake up by RTC means. So we did, uh, I did a quick test before uh, designing this, embarking on this design using the Leonardo with the XB. This is a special Leonardo which has an XB footprint on it where you plug onto it. Yeah, so I ex um, explained last, last time. The first struggle was that when I first got my XB, it didn't work either. Yep, that was because it was at um, firmware revision 1140B. So after struggling through with um, the XCTU, which is the application software for configuring this thing, it, um, it got upgraded to 1140C. And since three weeks ago, two more updates have arrived, making it um, the latest one right now. Yeah, so um, prior to updating it, even the Singapore SIM card didn't work. That's because prior to 1140C at B and A, it did not support Singapore uh, bands or it couldn't select Singapore bands, which is the nine, sorry, 800, 
I'm sorry, the 900 and the 1900 megahertz um, bands, right? So it, it could support selecting those bandwidth. So only after upgrading to 1140C, it, it finally worked. So here we can see, recap. Um, after I, also, after I had gotten it working, right? Somehow it failed during one of the days of testing. That was because this was on the 31st of November. Yeah, and my, um, sorry, 31st of October. My SIM card expired <laughs> without warning, right? So after some calls to Singtel and all that, we found out that it's expired. And then I finally got my new, my new um, Singtel card here. Well, it looks like something you can buy from 7-Eleven, yeah? but really, <laughs> you need to go to the offices and actually negotiate with them just to get this card. So after negotiations, probably you can get this um, membership for only $2 a month. Yeah? So the cost of running NBIOT is actually quite low. So, last week, I'm sorry, last presentation, I promised to get a PCB out. Here was my drawing, and that was the proposed enclosure. I have finally completed it, um, completed the drawing, and then had it fabricated from JL PCB. This is the first time I'm using them, right? They're really good. $2 for quantity of 10 Shipping is eleven fifty. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I I sent in the drawings on Monday morning. Yeah. Um, I actually option check for them to verify the board manually, and then in the evening they finally verified it. I paid on Monday evening. On Wednesday morning they said they had shipped it out already. So I'm quite happy, right? That's Monday night into the whole of Tuesday, and. Wednesday 9.30, they had shipped it out. Yeah, I finally received it on Saturday. So that's within the week. I'm quite pleased with their service. The assembly? Yeah, um, no, no assembly, uh, just the blanks. Right. Yeah. So the following week, I had them um, assembled myself. This is manually soldered, right? So, um, so this is the completed um, device here. I built two of them. One of them has been taken away. Well, okay, so, so excited, right? I've got ESP32 working, the XB sits nicely on it. So one of the first things I did was scour the net, right, to look for example programs. Yeah, we cut and paste. So I found a Mauser. They had a similar project using the Arduino connecting to, connected to the XB LTE module and connecting to a, to an uh, IoT server called UbiDots. So I, I was unfamiliar with this uh, um, service, UbiDots. However, I know about ThingSpeak. So I converted that program, instead of using UbiDots REST system of connecting to an IoT server to MQTT, and then um, I changed all the references of UbiDots to ThingSpeak, and it started working. I actually sent data to ThingSpeak. So I was quite pleased in in one week of assembly, this thing works, right? So I didn't bother with all the necessary details of an IoT device yet, so I haven't implemented sleep mode yet. So you can see that it consumes 56 milliampers, which is quite high. And then on, during transmission peak, there, there is a current consumption of about 150 or a little more than that. Yeah, so if we wanted this to last a long time in the field, um, we had to bring down the power consumption really low, and the target was only one milliampere while sleeping. Okay, so um, in my last two days, I was experimenting of how to bring the ESP32 down into sleep mode. Yeah, so I have issues already found that I have to make changes to this board. So I forgot to add a reset button. That makes development very hard, right? Every time on the reset, <laughs> I have to find a little jumper wire. And yeah, so, yep, next board must have reset button. Okay, ESP32, it has its quirks also. Not all the GPIOs are so versatile, yeah? Only certain GPIOs can be used to wake up from sleep. 
So I found this out very late. You can see these two wires. They're, they're used to make the changes there. Okay, my board consists of two, two means of supply, right? There's a bug regulator as well as an LDO. So when I experimented with the bug regulator, I found that the operational current, it's Poisson current, eh? um, is about 1.5 milliamps. So that's quite high. It's already over my, over my budget. So I, I, since I had an alternative, I removed the bug and put in the LDO. The footprint actually has been designed in there. Yeah? And the LDO consumes a very low 300 microamperes. This is in addition to supplying all the other peripherals supposed to be sleeping. So 300 milliamperes, 300 microamperes is actually quite good. Okay, here's the problem. When I experimented with ESP32 sleep mode, 300 microamperes, good. But when it wakes up, right, there's this huge inrush of current at 200 milliamperes. I will show it to you later. Um, I've already programmed this particular bot to go into sleep for 10 seconds and then wake up for a brief moment and going back to sleep. You can, if you look closely at the digital multimeter in slow motion, you can see peaking of um, 100, uh, about 150 to 200 milliampere. Yeah, so this 200 milliampere in rush, right, actually causes the battery voltage to drop. So now this board already has been designed with 4.2 volts lithium iron. Uh-oh, 2 volt drop means I got 2 volts left. So the thing goes into coma, right? It doesn't go to sleep and wake up. It just stays... <laughs> da. So when I adjusted the power supply, which is simulating the lithium iron higher and higher to about 4.5 volts, 4.7 volts, then it goes to sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up. So immediately I texted my, my um, customer, hey, I think we need to change to 8.4 volt battery. Yeah, so because of that, um, uh, many things have to change. The charger has to be changed because the, although the charger is configurable for either 4.2 volts, 8.4 volts or 12.6 volts, right? The pin is stuck underneath the DFN. So <laughs> there is no way I can splice it anymore already. So I, re I really need a new revision, right? And then now he turns back to me, okay, fine, we do a new revision. He says, feature request, find, another, find a way to put another module, this SIM 7000 module, into the same PCB. Yep, so um, I guess I end my talk here with all my struggles. Huh? So I guess another talk next year. <laughs> any, any question? I'm going to power up this. With the power supply. Okay, this power supply has been configured to 8.4 volts to simulate a, an 8.4 volt battery being plugged into the battery connector here, right? And I'm going to switch the digital multimeter to current mode. The board wakes up. When the LED shuts down, it goes to sleep for 10 seconds. And then it wakes up again and goes to sleep. That is good, yeah? And the power, you can see, only 360 microamperes. <laughs> now, if you pay close attention to the digital multimeter, you'll see that 360 microampere will jump to something in the region of maybe about 50. But if you look even closer and even slower, you can see 151 or 180 milliamperes. So that's a huge inrush during that brief moment. Now, I read through the forums, it is not the ESP32 itself, the microcontroller, but it is the flash that sits beside it. So every time it's waking up from sleep, it's rereading the entire user program into the memory of the ESP32 at high speeds. And it is high speed where it drinks a lot of um, current. Right, so if anyone else here is experimenting with ESP32, especially deep sleep modes, uh, these are some of the things to remember. Um, why not use a capacitor? Okay, I, I, 
forgotten to take pictures. I did try capacitors. First, I had um, that one change from 10 micro, now it's 100 micro. The, the input of the LDO now has an additional 100 micro. And then um, what's not here now, I've taken it out, right? There was a 470 micro here and a 1,000 micro at the battery terminal. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> yeah, the power dip was around 60 to 80 milliseconds. It is so long that it dropped down to 2 volts for that long. And uh, no amount of capacitor, unless you're talking about big ones, yeah, could have um, mitigated that. I, it might, but I, 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 I wouldn't, I don't think so. Then it was quite a bunch of capacitors down there. Yeah. So I think the, my only resolution is to ask the customer to change it from a 4.2 volt um, power solution to an 8.4 volt. That way with any power dips, even when the XB is transmitting out, um, the supply rails can cope with the requirements. Any other questions? No? Can the ESP32 go lower than 300 macro? I think the ESP32 takes less than 300 micro amperes. It's, um, the supply is supplying other peripherals that is trying to sleep also. So, yeah. Um, I think it does take less than that. Anything else? Mike, Luther? No? So next year, okay. we can go to the farm, farm place again? Oh, <laughs> I would love to, yeah, and have a barbecue there too. <laughs> All right. So, yes. Is there any plan that you want to um, The project isn't open source, but if you want to take a peek, I can always show it to you. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> That's a possibility, but unfortunately, a, a, a client pays me at the moment. Yeah, so I, until he decides otherwise, yeah. Uh, anyway, are you afraid of the improvement in regulation in terms of the NPR of Singapore and Malaysia? I don't know yet. I, don't know. I'm not, yeah, I only know that only Singtel and M1 has this service, and I don't know of any service in Malaysia just yet. Yeah. So again, um, what we do today is experimentation and preparation for future use. Uh. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know. All I know, I'm limited in bandwidth to 250, ki 250 kilobits a second. I, I don't know the the what do you call it. Yeah, maximum data and the uh, recurrent rate and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm still struggling at the hardware side. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah. Yes. Yes, he, you're right. He, um, those are considerations, which is why he chose to remain. So the question is that. Um, are there any other considerations for other technologies? Yeah, he chose to remain, although he wants me to put a SIM 7000C um, module here, um, he still wants these um, XB connectors in place so that he can experiment with other, um, other technologies. So XB module comes in a variety of technologies also. I, they started out with Zigbee and then now they have um, LTE, cellular, uh, LoRa as well. I'm not sure about six box. Huh? Yeah, you, you have to pay, yeah. So what would be the reason to stick to the SIM 7000? What would be the reason? Oh, cost reasons. Only yeah, only cost reasons. So we suspect because the entire board um, on retail, this entire hat or what is it, shield on retail is $39. So we suspect this module is ten dollars only. This is our suspicion.
Yep. Anything else? No? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>